I love revolutions. We are in the beginning stages of one of the most amazing revolutions the world has ever seen. I firmly believe that. Um, in fact, I wrote a book called The Maker Movement Manifesto. Please buy it early, buy it often, give it a five star. Um, and I'm actually trained as a Green Beret to help foment revolution. So I actually, when I say manifesto, I mean that for real. And as a Green Beret, I love to hear things explode. And so there are going to be some interesting spots where you're going to want to participate and you're going to want to say boom. So I'm going to encourage that. We're going to practice real quick. And then throughout the presentation, when I go like this, I want you to say boom, and it'll be a lot more, lots of interaction. So one, two, three. A little louder. Come on. One, two, three. All right, let's get going. So let's talk about some things that have come out of our locations. We have three in the Bay Area. Every single one of the ideas that I'm going to show you came out of a location here in the Bay Area. I often get asked, the maker movement, that's for crafting people, right? This is for kids. This is little education. You kind of learn how to solder. And I say, absolutely true. That is absolutely true. However, there are revolutionaries that are doing amazing things in these spaces. In some instances, they're literally changing the world. So we've been open about eight years. We have eight locations across the US. We'll double, hopefully, by this time next year. More importantly, what that means is instead of having 7,000 members, we'll have 14,000 and then hopefully 28,000 and so forth. So this is one of my favorite examples. You can actually see this next door. They've brought an example of it. Ken Hawthorne and his team came to our Menlo Park location and built the world world's fastest electric motorcycle in a maker space. The world's fastest electric motorcycle. 218 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats two summers ago. They won Pikes Peak this last uh, summer. Not only did they beat all of the other electric motorcycles, they destroyed the entire motorcycle field. When was the last time you saw a professional race and the second place finisher came in 20 seconds later? 20 seconds, that's humiliating. Ken had a massage and a beer by the time the Ducati monster came across the finish line. One, two, three. Yeah, baby. Andy's working on a jetpack. One, two, three. Boom. We've got three CubeSats that have been launched. Um, uh, this is a view from the International Space Station looking down over the Indian Ocean. So these were college kids who got their CubeSat going down in San Jose. NASA helped them. Um, I love this hack. You see the, the, uh, the yellow tape there. So you need to have antennas that automatically deploy. That's measuring tape. So it goes click and the measuring tape goes junk, junk, and there's the antenna. It's a beautiful hack. Michael was an early, uh, an early member of our Menlo location. The staff comes to me and says, you gotta go meet this guy. So I go in, I meet him, say, hey, Michael, what are you working on? I am working on a desktop diamond manufacturing device. It's like, of course you are. <laughs> How does it work? Oh, he says it's easy. So you know he's crazy, right? Nobody, nobody can say desktop diamond manufacturing is easy. It's like, okay, so I know he's crazy, and then he proceeds to scare me to death. Like, well, how does it work? Oh, you pump 95% hydrogen in this port, 5% methane in this port, put in an incredible amount of energy, and diamonds fall out. One, two, three, boom. He's doing it in his garage. It's incredibly accessible. Tina came in, took one class on the laser cutter, and on a Saturday, she made her first project, took it to a, a birthday party, a little cupcake topper, said Bobby, Jimmy, Jane, and so forth. And at the end of the party, every single kid not only wanted their own, but the parents came in and said, I want one for all of my other kids. She walked out of that birthday party with hundreds of dollars in orders, not even knowing she was in business when she arrived in the morning. One, two, three. Boom. Perrin completely re you know, redid his life. So he was an ad copywriter for Hearst Magazine and lost his job. He's 62, 63 years old. He comes in and says, Mark, I'm never going to work as an ad copywriter again, so I'm going to do the obvious thing and become a jeweler. <laughs> right. Good luck with that, Perrin. So he took a bunch of classes, and sure enough, six months later, he's got his stuff in the MoMA Museum, and he's selling it out of the museum store. He's now distributed in about 34 different museums around the U.S., and he's got a whole niche around zoos where he creates jewelry with animals on it. He re literally rebooted his career. I love David. He came in, and I talked to him. He said, Mark, I don't know how to make anything. He says, well, that's not true. I'm really good with email. 
yeah, all right, that doesn't really count. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every single class and I'm going to become a professional maker. He wrote an uh, article, a, a series of articles for uh, Make Magazine called Zero to Maker. He's got a great book. I highly recommend it. But get this. He comes in, I think it was like a January. He doesn't know how to make anything. By September, he owns an underwater robot company. How do you do that? The way you do that is you use easy, powerful, remarkable tools to be able to build what you're dreaming. We're moving into an era where if you can think it, you can make it. If you can think it up this morning, you can prototype it this afternoon. Britt came in, she's a former uh, Googleite, came in um, and she was getting ready for her wedding and she learned how to use a bunch of tools and made a whole bunch of stuff for her wedding. At the end of it, all of the people who came said, I want that greeting card. I want that kit. I want to do this. She launched a company, it's called Britt & Company. She just raised a $20 million Series C. One, two, three, boom. I highly recommend uh, her products. Mark came in, so, uh, like a Monday morning, he had heard about us over the weekend at the shelter in downtown San Francisco. He was living in the shelter. Read our little brochure, came in at the nine o'clock that morning, spent his last $50 to become a member and completely rebooted his life. He took the laser cutter class. The next day he comes in and he starts making, he literally pulls in stuff out of the trash can, makes something out of it, goes on the street, sells it, gets really good at be using the laser cutter. People start hiring him to do their work. He buys a laser cutter, starts a laser cutter company, hires some people, his family moves back in. Most importantly, what I love about Mark is he's now doing it for other homeless people. He's created a 501c3. He goes out into the shelters. He finds people like him. He brings them into tech shop. He gets them food. He gets them housing. He gets them training. And he gives them three months of mentors so that they can launch their own business. One, two, three, boom, you rock it, Mark. Espen um, started a 3D printing company. They're doing like a couple hundred units a week. They now have a 20,000 square foot facility in San Leandro. I love this one. Max came in, he uh, wanted to own his own lamp company. Now what's interesting about the combination of, of Indiegogo, Etsy, um, and Tech Shop is that 10 years ago it didn't exist. Now it does. But you can now launch a lifestyle business if you can build a prototype. You couldn't launch lifestyle businesses unless you could put your home up for the SBA. No angel group in their right mind will fund a lifestyle business. No venture capitalist is interested. The SBA wants assets. So if you're like a mid-20s person and you've got some great idea and you have no assets, 10 years ago, you kept your job. Now you don't have to. So Max came in, learned how to use the laser cutter, learned how to use Arduino. He'd never done Arduino before, built his prototype. I ran into him, he said, I need to raise $60,000 on Kickstarter. And I told him, dude, you can't do it. That 60 grand is, that puts you in the top 10% of all successful campaigns. Nobody's ever funded a lamp company. Really, you're looking for 60 grand to start a lamp company? He says, well, Mark, you don't understand. You know, they're really pretty. <laughs> And he was right. You know what? He raised $480,000. His instantaneous biggest problem was one, he had a job that he had to quit. And two, he had to manufacture 4,800 of them when he had originally figured out he was going to manufacture 600. So, you know, he went to China and got it, uh, got it done. These guys, though, this next one, didn't go to China. So this is Oro Kayak. The first time I ran into uh, Anton, he was wrestling a 12-foot piece of plastic. Frankly, he was losing. Um, it, was quite, it was really quite, uh, quite entertaining. I asked him, Anton, what are you doing? He says, I am building a collapsible kayak. Now, my instant thought, you know, gray hair, MBA, that's a stupid idea. Who wants a collapsible kayak? I mean, raise your hand. I want to be out in the bay, floating around, and it collapses. The main feature of a collapsible kayak is what? It folds. Really bad idea. It turned out I was completely wrong. By the way, he did change the name. He now calls it Oru Kayak, so it doesn't like talk about collapsing. He raised $440,000 on Kickstarter and was on Shark Tank um, and raised a bunch of money on, on Shark Tank. This last, uh, you know, when the Giants uh, won the World Series recently, it's like half of all the kayaks out in the bay were Antons. They were absolutely uh, remarkable. Another one of my favorite stories, because it's like, you know, you know, what did you do in the summer of 2012? Patrick comes in and asks, what classes do I need to take to learn how to use the tools to make an iPad case out of bamboo and book binding? 90 days later, he had sold a million dollars in product. 90 days. 
doesn't have the skills, and 90 days later it's a million. He did it 4 million in the first year, 10 million in the second, 35 million in the third. He's got a manufacturing facility down in Dogpatch. He's got 25 employees. He saved a bookbinding company here in San Francisco. His primary user, oh, it didn't click, here we go. His lead user is no less than the President of the United States. One, two, three, boom. None of those changed the world. These have. Square came out of our Menlo location. I love this one because what happened with them is they came up with the idea, they hit ostensibly the smartest venture capitalist in the world. Some of them are probably here in the room now. Sorry, guys. They saw the PowerPoint and turned them down. Turned them down. Jack Dorsey got turned down the first time he pitched this company. What happened is James then came to Menlo, learned how to use an injection molding machine, learned how to do the electronics, learned how to, to use a CNC, built the prototypes, and they went back with a prototype that worked and famously took $50 off each of these guys, didn't give the money back. I love it. It's the first people I've ever heard of who've actually charged the VCs for a presentation <laughs> and raised $10 million. If Jack Dorsey can't raise money without a prototype, how do you expect your teams to do it without a prototype? You can't, and the good news is 3D printing, electronics, everything's cheap. Phil Hughes and his team launched a company that's gonna help save the globe $25 billion annual in electricity. Emerson Electronics immediately licensed it. It's a liquid-cooled server cabinet that's going into uh, data centers all over the world. Nick is one of the top five agricultural startups of the year in 2014. It's a nitrogen detection device that helps figure out how much fertilizer is in the ground before the, the planting season, reduces fertilizer cost, and reduces runoff zone uh, uh, fertilizer. This is a camp stove that recharges your electronics. It won a Fast Company Award. It's a nice little stove. This is the, another agricultural startup of the year. It was the cheapest drip irrigation system on the planet. Note, two of the five top agricultural startups of the year came out of a maker space in 2014. And my favorite is Jane Chen's blanket. I won't go into all the details other than to say Jane and her team have saved 150,000 babies. And 10 years ago, she couldn't have done it because she didn't have access to the tools. Now she and her team do. The impact that we've had in the Bay Area alone in the last six years, $12 billion in incremental shareholder value, $2 billion in sales, 2,000 jobs, $200 million in annual salaries. The state of California is making more money annually on that $200 million than we've spent on the entire platform in, the, in California. That's why we're building these things as fast as we possibly can. So what's next? Really, the question is, how big is your imagination? The tools are the easiest they've ever been, they're the most powerful they've ever been, and they are incredibly cheap. You can become a member for $150 a month. This is truly revolutionary. We're having impacts in manufacturing, healthcare, education, and of course, one of the things we're here for, the Internet of Things. Access to tools is everything. Welcome to the revolution. One, two, three, boom. Thank you.